Thank you again for coming. My name is Sarah Krongard. I'm a PhD student in Emerging Media Studies. I'm excited to moderate today's uh, industry panel. The structure will be a little different than the prior panels. We're going to have um, a little Q&A in the beginning, and hopefully it's kind of a roundtable discussion rather than formal presentations. Um, and then we'll leave about 20 minutes at the end for, for questions from you, the lovely audience. Um, so it would be great if you start start jotting down those questions as we speak. Um, so first, I would just love for our panelists to introduce themselves, do a little bit of an introduction, just um, your names and role and your company that you work with, and um, a bit about how you got there, so your background, I think we would all love to hear. So, uh, do you want to begin, Stephanie? Yeah. <laughs> I'll begin. Um, I'm Stephanie Leishman. I, uh, let's see, I came to Boston uh, 15 years ago uh, to do my undergraduate degree at Harvard, and I studied ancient art history. And then I uh, w went to Uruguay on a religious mission, and then I came back and I worked for MIT for seven years. When I was at MIT, I actually managed their digital strategy, uh, focusing on social media. Um, and, oh, and I should probably let you hear me hear what I'm saying. <laughs> Um, so at MIT, I worked at MIT for seven years here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, managing their social media strategy, uh, digital integration, uh, some email marketing as well. And uh, while there, I advised uh, over 100 departments on their digital strategy. And I um, then decided, you know what, I need to do, uh, put some more adventure in my life. So I started an MBA program here at BU at at the Questrom School of Business, doing a dual degree with a Master of Science in Information Systems. So I'm doing a bit of coding now, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. And I also started my own company, Apiarity, uh, helping mission-driven organizations with their social media strategy, making it exceptional. So that's me, thanks for having me, I'm very grateful. Thank you, Bob? Hi everyone, I'm Bob Cargill, and it's great to be here. This is really exciting. Great group up here at the table, and you guys are so awesome. Great, great projects. I looked at all seven of them, I think. I hope I counted right and, and checked out all of them and put them out on Twitter. Great to be here. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, right now, I am Director of Social Media at Overdrive Interactive in Alston. We're a digital marketing agency. There's about 35 of us or so there. I manage a small team. We provide content, strategy, and metrics and measurement on behalf of a handful of B2B tech clients as well as B2C. Of course, my career, geez, I've been in marketing forever, it seems. I'll, I'll go back one step further. I graduated from, not BU, but uh, the University of Massachusetts uh, in Amherst. And I will say both my parents, and I confirmed that this morning, have degrees from BU, master's <laughs> degrees, and my wife graduated from BU. And a couple times a week at night when I run from Austin to Kenmore Square and back, I often run by BU. That's my BU connection. Um, I mentioned I worked in marketing forever. I started back in, so after UMass, I went to Brooklyn College, got a master's degree in television, but ironically got my first job as a copywriter at RCA Direct Marketing, and that was, believe it or not, back in the day when it was records, vinyl, and tapes, cassette, and I had a stereo in my office, and that was really cool. Might have been the best job I've ever had. <laughs> it was really neat. And, but I was a copywriter from day one, worked at Meredith Corporation, a publishing company in Des Moines. I've worked at a lot of agencies. The best boss I've ever had was Myself, um, <laughs> 1990 to 97, I had my own agency, Cargill Creative. And I say agency, it was small, it was really a virtual agency, but I did hire design as other writers and did pretty well for seven years. And that ended in 97. And then, like I say, since I've worked mostly in agencies, copywriter, creative director, direct mail mostly, then it was email, and now it's all social media, and I love it. I started my blog in 2004, a new marketing commentator, and I haven't looked back. And yeah, so that's where I'm at today, and it's really exciting to be here again. Thank you. Thank you. 
we could say the applause, but that's <laughs> wonderful how excited everyone is. Um, Jen, you want to? Hi, everyone. My name is Jen Filio. Um, first and foremost, I'm a proud graduate of the EMS program. Graduated last year, so oh. I was in a lot of your shoes just a year ago. Um, I am from Massachusetts. I grew up here. I went off to school in Vermont and studied political science and got really into environmental and energy issues while I was up there. Um, moved back to where I'm from on the Cape and worked for a very grassrootsy public education organization that was organizing around an offshore wind farm. Um, and from there, moved to another organization that was doing kind of similar work uh, where I'm currently still the Civil Society Institute, and what I do there is kind of coalition building and strategic campaigns, connecting with very grassrootsy groups in areas that are really directly impacted by energy and water issues. Um, and a lot of what I do, it kind of happens um, because I was oftentimes the youngest person doing these things, but they came to me looking for social media advice. Um, a lot of these areas are in places where there isn't even really high-speed internet access. Um, so concepts like utilizing Facebook to organize a campaign, I mean, that's still brand new in a lot of these places and, and with these all-volunteer grassroots groups. Um, so as I was kind of doing that and exploring the idea of a master's, that's how I found this BU program. Um, and while I was here, I studied how nonprofits and campaigns utilize social media um, and what the opportunities are for their social media use. Um, I also connected through a class that I took with Professor Guo, hi Professor Guo, <laughs> um, with an organization locally called the Massachusetts Oyster Project, and they are working um, to organize within the state to get more oyster restoration beds off our coasts as a means of cleaning our harbors, because oysters actually filter a lot of water, and that's kind of the natural ecosystem's way of keeping the harbors clean. And through that connection, I got more incre increasingly involved with the organization, and I was just elected president of their board of directors a couple of weeks ago. So um, one of the reasons they brought me on is because of my studies in emerging media, and they want to utilize um, really social media and new technologies, web platforms that are geared towards growing membership-based groups. Um, so a lot of the studies that I had here have really impacted the direction I'm able to go, um, both in my full-time job and now also with this Oyster Project. So I'm excited to be here today and see how much the conference has grown since last year. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. Thanks, Jen. Eric? Hi, Eric Leist. I um, graduated from BU uh, College of Communication in 2010. Um, and I majored in public relations there. And then um, my first job out of college, I worked on the ad agency side um, for Allen and Gerritsen, some mid-size agency based in Boston. Now they have an office in Philadelphia too. Um, and uh, there I was working mostly in a strategy role for a lot of regional clients and national clients, but more of the regional branches, um, companies like Comcast and Sears, um, but also companies, the New York New England companies like 99 restaurants and Hannaford supermarkets and uh, Papa Gino's. Um, so a lot of kind of, I, I got a sense of a lot of different industries and the um, marketing challenges that they have. Uh, then I worked for a couple of different companies on the technology side, mostly marketing technology companies. And um, currently I'm at a company called Owner IQ, which is a um, programmatic display advertising company that serves retailers and product brands. So um, what does that mean? Um, uh, you're familiar with the practice of retargeting in display ads. You go to one website and all of a sudden everywhere you go on the web, you start to see ads for the same site you just visited. Um, we allow product brands and retailers to essentially retarget each other's audiences. So we've built technology that says, okay, Canon cameras, um, you wanna retarget users that are viewing your products on bestbuy.com, you can do that through us and vice versa, bestbuy.com, you wanna reach people that are researching the products that they're considering buying on the products website, you can do that too. Um, and so we've kind of set up this uh, really interesting, what we call it an, an audience exchange, um, where retailers and brands can basically share each other's audiences. And um, we're doing that programmatically, which means that we, uh, hundreds of billions of times a day, 
make decisions on an individual basis as to which consumers we want to reach with which ads, and we try to predict which ones are going to um, convert. So the goal is to kind of reach as many people with as much relevant advertising as we can. Um, and um, my role at the company is basically to take all of that technology that we've built and um, figure out how to leverage everything that's available on mobile devices in order to um, scale it that way. So I'm in a product development role. Um, and that's what I'm doing. Great, thank you. So I think, okay. <laughs> I love the enthusiasm with the clapping. I love clapping. So I say we keep doing it, but, but just, <laughs> yes, right? It makes people feel good. <laughs> But so at this point, um, I'd love to hear a bit more about um, specific technologies that you're using and for, on, on two levels, because I think there's the work that you do, kind of what you do, and then there's how you do it. So the, the tools that allow you to do the work that you do. So on two levels, kind of like the content of your work and also the logistics, the processes, how you use those tools to facilitate the work that you do. So if you could talk a bit about that, if that question makes any sense. Um, anyone? Anyone, any takers for that? Ah, sure, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not shy. <laughs> so, social media is, there are a lot of tools and technologies we use, and you heard me mention that I've been in this business forever, and so back in the day, we didn't have all those tools and technologies, not at all. I've gone from writing direct mail to email, and now social media. Writing social media means you're not just a writer, though. You wear many, many hats and you have to know design to some degree, you have to be an analyst to some degree, so the writing is easy for me. It was, and I say was, because most of these tools I have learned, although they keep coming at us, rapid fire, and the tools we use are changing constantly, but let me name just a few, a lot of them you're gonna know, of course, uh, the major platforms we, put content out for our clients on everything from Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Pinterest, YouTube, am I missing anything, Vine, of course I'm missing some, Instagram, uh, Snapchat maybe. Um, we use, so in the course of my day I get into work, if we're going, can I go through the day in you the life? You can go through the day in the life, that sounds and great. cut me off if I'm going on too long, don't No, wanna. it sounds lovely. So, when I get into the office, I commute in from Sudbury to Austin, long commute already, I jump on my computer and I quickly look at Feedly, which is an RSS reader, so I look at all the news of the day, all the content that's coming in. I will share some of that on my own personal account using Buffer, so now I'm gonna start naming some specific tools. I also go to TweetDeck. And in TweetDeck, which is owned by Twitter, it's a, uh, for power users, if you will, I probably have about 60 columns set up, including all of our clients, including a lot of uh, particular people and brands I wanna follow very, very closely. So I check all of them out. Then I go to Socialize. Socialize is our proprietary at Overdrive social media dashboard. That's where we publish, that's where we schedule, publish, and then measure the content that we put out on behalf of our clients. Um, what else? I am looking down at my notes just because I, I wrote down a few notes here. We use Mention. Mention is a way to, uh, it's a third party tool. We pay for that and that helps us again listen, if you will, to what is being said about our clients or about certain keywords. Uh, in the past, we've used Radiant 6. We're not using that right now, but that's a similar tool. And Skype, we use all day. I'm trying to mention the tools and technologies. That's how we instant message each other right in the office to stay in touch for meetings. We use GoToMeeting. We use Google Hangouts occasionally. Um, this guy is by my side all the time, and my wife can attest to this as soon as I get home. I'm on the laptop, and usually until the time I go to bed, the laptop comes upstairs, I watch TV while I'm either looking at Twitter or sometimes I'm frivolously tweeting about a TV show that I'm watching, but often I'm writing a blog post because I also have my own blog. Uh, what else? In I mentioned all the hats we wear. Video is another one, so you have to keep up with Facebook Live and Periscope. You have to be comfortable in front of a camera, not just behind it. 
So I think I've covered a lot of tools, technologies, etc. Yeah. Jen, go ahead. I kind of have an opposite experience. Um, <laughs> One that you, I mean, you just mentioned Facebook Live, but even just Facebook, you, I don't think you said it all. Um, and I work, because I'm working with grassroots organizations, oftentimes they're all volunteer groups, which kind of translates to many retirees working on these issues. And for them, they feel tech savvy when they have email on their phone. And so, like one group I was working with, they were excited because the particular issue that they were organizing around, there were 95 Facebook groups that had formed in their community around it. All of those Facebook groups had like 10, 10 members. So it was just kind of the basics of saying, okay, well instead of 95 groups that you need to communicate with, why don't we try to get everyone in the same group um, and organize them, and that way you can communicate all at once. Um, even constant contact, which I don't even know if many of you know what that is, but it's still, it's just an email. It's a way to email a lot of people at once without crashing your server, essentially. And so even just getting a lot of these groups up to speed on how to email 500 people at the same time, um, that's kind of, there's the front end of where everything is going, but I think there's still a lot of people that are, that are still behind on, um, Especially the issues that I work on and in the areas that I'm that I'm working on it um, It's easy to think like Facebook's so obvious But a lot of people still really need to get up to speed on that and especially when you're talking issue-based campaigns and politics and that sort of thing where Most of the people that are that are involved You've got the young reddit crowd But you've also got a lot of the older generations that are still trying to figure out what everyone's talking about on this Twitter mechanism so that's, I have the opposite. <laughs> I'm like, here's how you sign on to Facebook, yeah. here's how you send an email. Yeah. Um, I, I, I like what you said, Jen, that you, know, you do have to focus on the basics. And um, I, have, I, I am more similar to Bob in many ways. Um, you know, all those tools, I love Feedly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just yeah. warms my heart that it exists <laughs> in the world. Uh, tools like that and you know your experience Bob um, I think the reason we, we experience this plethora of tools is that when you're a, a really strategic social media manager or digital strategist you start to recognize that the tools that are available don't give you one tool can't give you what you want because you know you start with questions and goals and you go from there Whereas if you take a tool-centric approach, you just go to the tool, then you only have the insights it offers, right? And so um, the danger, and I'm sure <laughs> a lot of experience this, especially on the analytics side, the danger is using a tool that defines for you what analytics should look like. So if you're using one tool like a Hootsuite and then you use its reports that it offers you, for example, it, the company itself is defining for you what metrics are important and how to look at those metrics, and that's very dangerous. And so having, using a wide variety of tools to get at your goals and the metrics that matter to your business is key. Um, and so I end up using uh, features of a lot of different tools like Hootsuite, like Crowdfire, Agora Pulse. Um, Later is great for, and Econosquare now, um, paid version for uh, Instagram. Um, but a lot of that, when, when you get down into the nitty gritty of, of being strategic about what you're doing, meaning you have to take a data-centric approach, the kind of tools I have to use are Excel with Power Pivot. I need to use Tableau. I need to get into anything uh, with, you know, with social media, you've got all of these analytics you've got to go through. So you have to use Open Refine to clean up your data, which was in um, the gun control poster, I liked that there was a cleaning data step. That was much appreciated. Um, and that then you have to use Python or some other tool to, to go through a huge variety of data. And the other tools will do this, but they won't tell you how they're doing it, and they won't tell you what's, what the right metrics are and how, how to kind of scrub those. And so using tools strategically is key, and that may mean you have to use several tools. And it also may mean that you go straight down, strip it down to the basics, and you look right in, you go straight into your Facebook insights. <laughs> so it's being a, in social media for us and, and using tools uh, starts to become a complex um, cognitive process <laughs> because you have to stay true to yourself and your goals and yet use what's available to you at the moment. 
Great, thanks, Eric. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I guess my role, it sounds like, is, is pretty different than, um, it sounds like you, you guys work a lot in, in the social media space, and I'm um, more on the, on the product development side for display advertising. So um, our tools, like from a strategic perspective, um, you know, we'll start our process by writing a market definition document, which we'll write in, you know, usually Google Drive or Microsoft Word. That doesn't really matter, but from a strategic standpoint, we try to craft an argument that um, there's business to be had by developing a new feature, and um, that there's a, you know, set dollar amount that we see from our clients or for prospects that are not yet our clients, and um, we'll build around market needs and establish market needs and get sign off from, um, basically our stakeholders in our company, which is our executive board and our tech leadership team. Um, and then we'll write a feature definition, which basically scopes out all the business cases that our technology team needs to build. Um, and uh, our technology team is on the other side of the country. It's in Seattle. So um, collaborating with them involves uh, a lot of different tools. We actually video chat a lot. Um, we have video chat set up in all of our conference rooms, so we're always like connecting to the team in Seattle. Just like with one click, we use a, uh, a tool called Video for that, um, uh, with a Y, not with an E. <laughs> um, and uh, we we do a lot of project management on a tool called Jira. If you ever end up working with engineers, you're going to end up using Jira probably, um, where basically you write. Uh, you write what's called a ticket or a card for each individual task that an engineer has to complete. And then there's ways to comment on it. It's very social, but from a standpoint of internal within the company and a, and a way to collaborate there. And then it uh, kind of allows you to visualize workflows. So you write something and it's in, um, you know, it's being scoped out and then it's in progress and then it's on a testing server somewhere and then it's in, and it's in user acceptance testing and then it's closed or resolved and you can kind of check that feature off. Um, so we use a, a lot of different tools and I think a lot of it is about internal collaboration. Great, thank you. Um, so I want to ask quickly, before we turn it over to the audience, but I want to ask a bit about research and how re what research means in your field and in your role um, and connecting back with the, the keynote this morning about kind of ethics and privacy and how we're using the data that we're able to to access via social media so thinking a bit about um, privacy and ethical concerns so what does research look like and how does how does privacy and ethics play into it anyone want to start us off with that I'll, I'll take I'll Great. take that one because uh, um, I always think this topic is really interesting on the on the ad targeting side of things mm -hmm. um, because uh, there are a couple of sort of non-government regulated uh, organizations that have formed out of these um, this whole ad tech ecosystem that came up. Basically, there's all these companies that know that um, if they start doing things that are generally accepted as creepy, <laughs> then the government's going to come along and shut them down. Uh, so there's a, there's a couple organizations like IAB and um, NAI, uh, National uh, Advertising Initiative, I think it's called, where basically they publish a set of guidelines that you self-regulate, uh, basically a set of rules that you just decide that you're going to follow and commit to following. Um, and they have to do with things like not collecting personally identifiable information like names or credit card numbers or uh, addresses or stuff like that. Um, and uh, also like allowing customers to, uh, or consumers to opt out if they want to, um, allowing some kind of mechanism for that. So I always think that that's a really, um, you know, the whole idea of consumer choices and, and walk in the line between, for us, how can we deliver the most effective advertising, but at the same time, um, follow the rules that are generally accepted, but not government regulated yet. So it's, uh, it's always an interesting thing to kind of navigate. We always have to figure out, okay, we're gonna build this great thing and then, how do people not use it if they don't want to? Mm -hmm. so. That's a great point. Anybody else interested? Or you can you can say no. No, thank you. <laughs> um, so <laughs> sure, stepping. This uh, trying to connect it. My my relationship with research is more on the uh, philosophy side than it is researching with social media. So hopefully it's relevant. But um, to inform my work. I do a lot of academic research, and the reason that's important to me is that I need to understand uh, audiences and the cultures we're in and how they're changing. Um, and so I do a lot of reading. Actually, I, whenever I do some really good reading, I post my thoughts on Elo, which is a social network that launched in 2014. So 
so find me on Nello. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> um, things are a little too dense for Twitter, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it, it's interesting because the reason research is so important is that it, it, it changes the way I work. And I really appreciated that Andrew Carlotto in one of the panels mentioned uh, Networks by Rainey and Wellman. Uh, because in that book, um, the authors talk about uh, sparsely knit personal communities and how really we're getting into the era of network theory um, where, you know, it's, media used to be targeted at demographics and people with certain personality traits or races or genders or whatever it is. And uh, you, you'd always have to reinvent the wheel in marketing where you target maybe just that demographic every time and try to reach all these individual people who are unrelated to each other but who are like each other. And now with network theory, um, it's much more powerful to target someone who's an influencer in a network. And in that network, they're, they're different from all the other people in their network, but what combines them is their, their connection to each other and kind of at forming dyads of people and those the relation, the tightly knit relationships they have with each other is what is, can be much more powerful in a marketing situation, especially in like referral marketing. And so, you know, I, I wouldn't have thought about this if I hadn't been doing research in emerging media <laughs> studies in, in essence, you know, what you're doing in classes um, and what you're doing with your professors. This research is key because you're getting into the real uh, cognitive layer and psychological layer of what is going on with the world and our cultural interfacing with emerging media and that it's changing. Um, I studied art history, so one of my favorite painters is Vasily Kandinsky. Um, I think he's Russian, but he's part of the German Bauhaus movement. And uh, he said, um, I wrote it down because I love it, every period of culture produces its own art, which can never be repeated. Um, he was a synesthete, so I think that um, uh, Britain, I think, would uh, enjoy the uh, cross-domain <laughs> connection there. Um, but this, this synesthesia of when you see a color, you hear a sound, right? <laughs> when you see a painting, you see a vase. And um, <laughs> that was for you, shout out. And, <laughs> um, but understanding the implications that, uh, of, of the hundreds of years of our history research we have, of science research that we have, of psychology, of philosophy, art theory, all of these come together to inform our practice as people who produce media or engage or analyze the behaviors of the people we're trying to reach. So that's my experience with research and why it's so important to me. Wonderful, thank you. Bob? Sure. Research in general, being in the agency world, is something I deal with all the time. Having worked for hundreds, maybe thousands, for all I know, clients over the years, first of all, we have to research who the client is. We have to research who we're targeting as an audience. And being a direct marketer by trade and now using social media to market to those audiences, we can measure pretty much everything we do. Stephanie mentioned Facebook Insights and there's uh, Twitter analytics, and I mentioned Mention and I mentioned Radiant 6, and I mentioned Socialize. These are all tools we use at Overdrive and that I use in the course of my day-to-day -day work to look at how what we're doing to market our clients is working and how we can do it better. At Overdrive, we have something we call Drive, Capture, Convert, Optimize. So we're trying to drive people to clients' websites convert them to customers, and then optimize whatever it is we're doing so that we do it better in the future. And that requires a ton of research and analysis. I want to jump over to, I think you mentioned ethics. Uh, sure. Yeah, I'll take a stab at that because mm -hmm. I do have um, a comment. Being in marketing forever, it's all about, I mean, I've been a writer, and my job is to convince, to persuade, one way or another, to get people to take action. And I used to, when I did presentations, I used to talk about verisimilitude, the appearance of truth. And I don't use that word anymore, although I just did, <laughs> because social media is transparent. Social media, to me, 
why I embraced it early on, it's a much more transparent, authentic, credible way of still marketing. So I'm still selling, I'm still trying to persuade, but on behalf of my clients, I'm persuading in a very straightforward, honest, authentic, real way. And I love that. I think it's much more, I won't say advertising and marketing by any stretch of the uh, mind are, are not ethical, but I think if there were degrees of ethicality, is that the right uh, form of that word? Um, social media, to me, is much more comfortable because what I tell clients, it's much more comfortable for me, and it should be much more comfortable for them because I tell them, just be yourselves. If you have a good product, if you have a good service, if you're a good person, and you, then you just be yourself, be your own brand, people are gonna flock to your website, and Eric's gonna help with the retargeting, Eric's company. Make sure they come back. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, make, yeah, sure make them back. come back. And you know, that's what it's all about, and I love social media marketing for that reason, because I think it's a combination of marketing, but also just being yourself. That's wonderful, thank you. Jen, do you want to chime in on research? No? I mean, just, I feel like I should because I did a whole year of research with, <laughs> with the Emerging Media <laughs> Studies program. Um, I, see, I, I mean, what I'm thinking is that I've got a theme here, which is that uh, the groups I work with really strip it down. And like, what I learned from Emerging Media Studies is that there are certain communication principles and theories that don't change regardless of the platform that you're utilizing. Um, people will always be communicating with each other in certain ways, um, and that kind of translates through technology, but those underlying theories don't really change. Um, I mean, I feel like I have to bring up, and I don't know if it got brought up this morning, but the way that Congress is having a sit-in currently and utilizing Periscope to broadcast that, um, Really what we're trying to do from an activist perspective is what are those old traditional organizing technologies and then, or not technologies, principles, and how do you utilize new technologies to enhance them? Um, they can't always really be substituted and that's why I find this congressional action so fascinating because it wouldn't work if Congress wasn't actually, those members weren't physically in that room, but it also wouldn't work without the new technology that allows them to broadcast that to the world. Um, so, yeah, I don't really do any basic research anymore. So, it's kind of what I learned and how I apply it to my current situation. That's terrific. Highlighting the use of theory, I think, is really helpful to know that it will play a role in our daily lives. Yeah. Um, so, I'm already receiving t text questions. So, I think we should open it up. Um, and <laughs> so, does anyone have any questions for the group? Bonnie. <laughs> um, I can read it out loud? Okay, that's fine. Here we go. Bonnie texts, <laughs> quote. I didn't know if you were on Twitter. Sarah. No, I appreciate it. With so many third-party platforms and apps to manage social media presence, what sets a superior app apart from the others? Thank you, Bonnie. Anyone? There's not, I guess this kind of goes to what I was talking about before. Um, there's not a one-size-fits-all. And a lot of my clients say, give me the tool that will solve all the problems, or what's the best tool? And there's not a one-size-fits-all. And so you have to start way back, go back a bit, and you have to say, what, are, what is my business strategy? What are my goals? What are the metrics that would indicate how close I am to those goals? And then you look at the tools and see what tools are actually going to measure those metrics or be able to manage the, the platforms that, that can get me to my goals. So, so really choosing the right tool um, really goes to you know, defining your business successfully first. Um, so it's always a disappointing answer. <laughs> it always is. But it's going to lead you to um, the better tools in the end. So I would say that the most, uh, the best tools, the best apps, certainly, first and foremost, they have to meet your need. They have to work. They have to be effective. But you also might not always be able to afford the best. So it has to be a combination of effective, affordable, and easy. And what I mean by that, I shouldn't say easy, but but relatively easy for whoever it is that's using it. So there are some, and I'm not going to name them, tools that might be 
awesome, but they're too expensive for everybody, or they're too complicated. So think of like a Facebook Live or a Periscope. These are apps or Instagram. You know, they're easy. They meet everybody's needs, and geez, they're free. Um, you know, those, you can't beat that. But again, at the enterprise level, when we're working for big, big clients, it's what I said earlier. I mean, they have to absolutely, um, to Stephanie's point, out one size fits all. You gotta find the tools that work, and that means testing. And then they're always changing, too, and that's very, very frustrating for us in the business, but that's the way technology is nowadays. Thank you. Um, Sammy? Yeah, kind of playing off this idea of a user experience, because that's so important for an app or any sort of um, platform to work. The question is mostly for Eric, just because you have a lot of history in mobile, but when you briefly mentioned you know, user acceptance testing, so what does that kind of testing research look like? I think um, some of us have been working on client projects, and a lot of that has been like, how do you determine what's a good user experience? There's been things like focus groups, but I'm wondering in like your experience, what kind of testing that has been? Yeah, so we have, I mean, um, well, I'll just clarify what I said. So user acceptance testing is weird because we have internal users as well. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of different departments that actually run campaigns end to end. Like we have a whole ad ops team that actually uses our, they're the primary users of our UI. Yeah. Um, we do have um, a good number of brands that are self-service. So they'll log into um, the, our UI and we'll have to do uh, user testing with them as well. Um, and we usually will look at, when it comes to that, um, we'll usually look at things from kind of both a qualitative and quantitative standpoint. So qualitatively, you know, is it easy to, you know, we'll, we'll, if we build a new screen, it will allow, I'll just give you an example, but allow someone to um, upload a, a new ad that they created, a new ad size, and manage where that ad is going to run. Um, we want to see if it's easy for them to use, if they get through that part of the process in an expected amount of time. We want to know what they say about it or if they have feelings about um, whether things should be different or it would make more sense if this button was on the left instead of the right, th those kind of details that um, are sort of qualitative. And then um, quantitatively, we'll, we'll look at kind of the whole user base across everybody that's, that's using our, our product, not just the people that we, um, we call them friendlies, mm -hmm. clients that we know we can say, hey, you know, we're kind of still working on this, what do you think? Mm -hmm. um, but but we, then when we roll something out to uh, our whole user base, we'll look at um, the data that's generated by their interaction with the product and maybe make decisions about that. So if we say, well, you know, we put this in front of two or three clients and they seem to like it, but we found out that they're actually pretty advanced and when we rolled it out to the rest of the user base, mostly people didn't understand it or they took too long or they messed it up. Um, so we, we'll kind of we'll take that that approach. Jacob, uh, as a soon-to-be graduate uh, <laughs> on the job market, uh, do you have any suggestions for looking for jobs in the field? Uh, any, you know, what are you looking for in a candidate? If you guys are involved in the hiring process, and any type of like skills that you know you guys would demand out of the candidate, will you hire me? <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, internships, of course. You, we absolutely bring on interns at Overdrive. We have a great program, and they get immersed in everything that we do. And I think it's so so important when. Way back in the day when I was in college, I had a couple internships. One was at WBZ-FM. It was an FM radio station attached to WBZ-AM, which is still around. Great radio station, great people, great experience for me because it was real-world experience. So get that. We see recent college grads with amazing resumes, and it's because of those internships, the real-world experience. And I will say, when I got my first job, I mentioned RCA Direct Marketing, it, so I had the masters in television, but I had a ton more real world experience as a writer. I'd written for my hometown newspaper, my college newspaper, for the yearbook. So I had something to show. So tie it back to social media now. 
You can have your own website, you can be active on Twitter, you can connect with people like us on LinkedIn, maybe we can't hire you right now, but networking is so key. We didn't have that back in the day. I had a little like recipe box with index cards and I'd cut out the ads in the paper and I'd tape them and put them in this index, uh, this recipe box when I applied for these jobs and we had to type letters and mail them. Sounds real antiquated, doesn't it? That's how it worked back then. Use social media, use technology to network with people. Um, if you don't mind, a couple more real quick things. Public speaking, communication skills are critical. Um, I graduated from UMass, but I went to Bates for a year and a half, my first three semesters. I took a public speaking course. I was so afraid, I can remember to this day, looking out at the audience and being really afraid, but it was one of the best courses I ever took, and then I took Toastmasters. Toastmasters I took around 1990 to 95. It teaches leadership skills and public speaking skills. So these are skills that come across no matter what kind of job you're looking for. The ability to speak, think on your feet, uh, have a good conversation with somebody. So communication skills would be, I'd emphasize. Another one is project management skills and like being able to manage your time well. Yeah. This is a super important one that I'd add. I mean, you said them all. <laughs> no, I but, you know, others, others. Yeah. but no matter how, how good you are at, at, at the platforms or the or publishing or engagement online or whatever, whatever the hard skills are, um, you have to be a person who has, who can manage all of that and work well with clients, that, which goes back to kind of what Bob Stephanie's said. absolutely right. I am not a project manager, and I'm, I'm serious. So, so what I mean is I... I that's a valuable skill, organizational yeah. skills. Especially, I was mentioning wearing all the different hats. That's so required nowadays. You can't just specialize in one thing. So if you're able to multitask and keep other people all together working as a team, extremely valuable. Yeah, I would highlight the networking. I mean, when you meet someone, find them on LinkedIn. You never know who they're gonna know that might hook you up with something. Um, get involved in, volunteer-based organizations that you care about because even if that group is not hiring, you meet other people through that that have real jobs that work in companies that can hire. Um, I would also say practical advice, having been in your shoes a year ago, see if you can get the research that you've done here in this last year published somewhere. There are tons of journals online and, and elsewhere. Um, submit it, see what happens, and that way when people are searching you after you've submitted applications places, if you've got your name tied to something in a real journal, you've already done the research, you might as well submit it around, take a few more hours, which I know is hard to do when you've just spent a year in grad school, you don't really want to spend that much more time doing that, but it will be worth it. I agree with all of that. Um, and also, I would add, you know, when, when, when I'm involved in the, in the hiring process and making a hiring decision, I, I usually will look for someone who can be, you know, really scrappy and help me figure things out. So I know, like, especially in, in my industry, and I know it's this way with social media platforms as well, um, so much is changing so fast that it's really valuable to be the kind of person who can figure out what's changing, figure out why, figure out what it means for you and your business and your clients, and, um, and draw some conclusions out of that, and then help educate everybody else that's on your team or in your company about these new things that are coming along and, and are changing. Um, because keeping up with everything is, uh, it's a big task, and it takes a whole company of people to really be on top of it. Um, and then I would also add that OwnerIQ is hiring, and um, you can talk to me afterwards or go on our website and look at our job listings. But we're growing like crazy, so. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, so someone who has a strong obsessed with entrepreneurship and kind of really looking at what I could do after finishing my MBA and possibly the Emerging Media Program, more so to Stephanie and Bob, what do you guys kind of like suggest if you want to start your own business more so in social media and maybe, you know, social media consulting and things like that? What was kind of, I guess, any advice? It's a broad question, but what kind of pushed you guys out on your own and what kind of helped you be successful in what you did? I'll go first, but Stephanie and Eric should absolutely jump in. Um, so when I started my business, my own business in 1990, I was much younger and it was before I was married. Um, what I'm getting at is do it while you're young. That, that is my absolute recommendation because 
um, is a little, you have a little less uh, responsibility, a little less uh, financial responsibility, um, unless your student loans are way up here. Um, but, and the networking is key. The networking is key because you need to have, so I'll tell you how I started my own business. I left and I only left where I was working um, when somebody told me they would give me a lot of business. So I knew I had a cushion. And so I, I had a big client coming out of the gate. So it's the networking to make sure you have the business and you have that foundation, that cushion, and then you have gotta do great work and you use word of mouth and referrals. And again, social media is great for that. Um, obviously, you gotta be really, really good at what you do as well. So, you know, there's a lot that's going on if you're gonna be successful on your own. Um, again, Stephanie, she's doing it right now. I, I did it in the past, but I think you're doing it right now and you could speak to it a little bit more. But it's not for everybody. But I did say being your own boss was, was my best experience in my career. I love all my bosses that I've had over the years, but it, nothing beats uh, having your own business in my mind. So I, I had a similar experience. Um, I played it safe. I didn't. Some people jumped in with both feet. They just quit everything. They just start from scratch. Um, when I was working at MIT, I had a lot of um, free, freelance clients um, that I would. People would come to me out of the woodwork, well, out of Twitter, actually, and <laughs> would say, "I saw you. What you do? Can you help? You know, our organization with social media." And it started growing to a point where I felt like, "Okay, I need to leave MIT." I need to start my own thing. So I did play it very safe. Um, what was interesting is, first of all, the, I think do it, working and, and edging in entrepreneurship worked for me, and I think it has worked for a lot of people as long as you're okay with kind of like uh, your time slimming and slimming and slimming down until you hit the critical point where you give up one or the other. Um, but there's a lot of learning that goes into it. I mean, I had to learn about um, where do I go to get a business license? How do I, you know, claim my business name? How do I, um, what do I need to know about um, the differences between a sole proprietorship and an LLC and an S Corp and a C Corp? I mean, how do I keep my accounting practices? How do I pay taxes? Like, I had to think through all of that to make sure that it was the right step for me instead of kind of going into it blind. So there's a lot, you know, that weighs on you as an entrepreneur because all of a sudden, you lose a lot of things that you would have in, in a nice, cushy job, like you know, health insurance and <laughs> who knows what. Um, but it's also very exciting. It's very, very exciting because now you are choosing your own clients and you're defining your mission and you're not doing any work that, I mean, not that a, a business would ever t you know, ask you to make unethical decisions, right? But when you do own your own business, you can make every decision aligned completely with your ethics. And I have turned down clients that I felt were not aligned with my ethics. Um, and that's actually a real benefit to me, because then I can live completely honest and true to myself and my business. So there's a lot of perks, there's a lot of burdens, and you have to decide what you want to do. So I'm kind of at the beginning, you know, I'm living, I'm going to live up to to uh, Bob's example, you know, <laughs> um, and uh, we've asked him, we should, I, I need some wisdom from him, <laughs> but that's my, we will do some networking, <laughs> yeah, but that's my uh, advice for you, and LinkedIn, everyone in this room, you're welcome to connect on LinkedIn with us, <laughs> I'm, mm -hmm. I'm speaking for all of us, <laughs> thank you, Bonnie, is there oh. another hand, um, so I guess, uh, kind of a departure from uh, the entrepreneurial position. When you have kind of a bureaucratic structure and you have a hierarchy and you have to convince a board or you have to convince uh, a VP or a president or whoever your superior may be or a group of superiors, um, what is your biggest challenge when it comes to getting them on board with either new technology or a new approach? Um, you know, departing from hey, you know, we need to do this basic approach with Facebook to hey, maybe we need to do something more sophisticated or something more technologically uh, complex. What is the biggest challenge in getting people on board with new technologies or new approaches to whatever your your job or task may be? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, for me, because uh, I do that a lot, um, you know, when we're, when we're talking about, you know, because 
for us in, in the product side of things, um, when, we, when we decide that we're going to build something, we decide we're going to build a new product or a new feature, um, it's, it's usually not that hard to, to get um, heads nodding and saying, oh yeah, okay, this is a good idea, and you can use data to back your, your story. Um, and, and I talk to a lot of our clients in order to help build a case for that. Like every time I talk to one of our clients, um, I'll take notes on what they say and I'll try to categorize what they're asking for or what they want to see. And I'll use that anytime I, I go into um, a meeting with our executive team and, and say we should actually, we should build this thing. Um, usually that part of it is not the hard part of it. The hard part of it is actually arguing your case that, um, that the engineering team should prioritize your feature over your colleague's feature or some other feature that's been in development for, for months. It's, it's um, you know, that, that's usually the, the, harder, the harder piece of it. And um, usually if you can tie it to an immediate business benefit, then um, they'll say, oh, actually, okay, we can make more money doing this option B as opposed to the track that we were on, which is option A. Um, and if you can do that, and for us, if you, for me anyway, if I can do that and I can keep the development cycle pretty lean, in other words, I can say, all right, we're only going to deliver, we're only going to dedicate like, um, you know, 20 or 40 hours of engineering resources to this new feature that we're building. Um, then we may say, okay, well, let's do that now and continue to work on the long-term stuff a little bit later because there's benefit to be had and the cost is not that high. So it's, for us, it's like, it's always weighing cost and benefits and, and not just getting buy-in on ideas, but also getting buy-in on priority. I, I talked earlier about skills, communication skills. I mentioned leadership skills briefly. That, uh, I should emphasize, the ability to lead a team is, is not something you see in everybody, and even if you have that ability, it's something you have to constantly work on to, to polish. And, and so I think the question was about bureaucracy and, and leading teams. And I tell the people I work with that that will probably be your biggest challenge in this, uh, in your career, meaning there's a lot of people who are really good at what they do. A lot of people have really, really good ideas, but to be able to sell those ideas, to be able to bring a team together, to manage up, in other words, to to convince your boss to do something, it's the hardest thing you'll ever do. Um, and I'm, I'm not kidding, in business, that's my opinion. Meaning, I'm assuming you can speak in public, I'm assuming you're good at what you do, you can write, so you qualify for the job, you get the job and you do everything well, but the, the one intangible, and I don't know if they teach it, is, is the leadership thing, the, the moving a mass of people to do something that you want them to do. And, and frankly, I mean, I still, it's a big, big challenge. I, with social media, when I started blogging, I, you know, I'd go around and talk about it and I felt like a fish swimming upstream in terms of trying to convince people that they should be blogging. And it's still the same to some degree with social media, trying to convince a client or a colleague or a friend that, hey, you should get on Twitter or Facebook. So again, that's the, do you have the ability to sell? Um, and that's something, if you have sales skills, you can lead a team and you can grow a business. That's, I should have mentioned it to the woman who asked about being an entrepreneur. Sales, the ability to convince people, that's important. Well, anyone else want to chime in on challenges? I don't do business marketing, but from a campaign perspective, there's a difference between getting someone to sign a petition online and getting them to actually show up and, and perform an action. And so that's really the biggest disconnect anyway between, I mean, and it's slacktivism, and I'm sure you all have learned a lot about it, but it's, it's a big challenge. And again, like I said earlier, that's why I think this con congressional sit-in where they're utilizing new technology, but they're using it as a tool, not as um, the entire action in itself. Um, it's so exciting because it really does seem like it's complementary to a more traditional tactic that really works. Wonderful. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I, uh, if you ask me tomorrow, I'll probably give a different answer and the next day I'll give a different answer. It's like a new challenge pops into my mind every time I think about it. <laughs> and um, I, I, having done 
some uh, a lot of nonprofit marketing has to say, Jen, that it is very difficult, <laughs> and because you have to focus on those actions more than ever before. Um, I think for me, the answer today is um, that language is changing, and every every platform kind of has its own language, and at the same time, we have our universal language, which is changing. I read a, a, an article recently on the Instagram engineering blog, and I actually tweeted a link to it, so go to Hatch Steph on Twitter if you want to read the link, but um, the article's called Emojineering, and it's basically talking about the new language of emoji that we have, and how you could tell a whole story in emoji if you needed to, really, and I've done it, it's pretty fun. And um, try it, it's, it's hilarious. And, you know, the fact that we may have the same lexicon, but the process of transferring information across a border from one person to another is becoming harder. And with emoji, for example, as a case study, you know, you have a red heart, okay, love, got it, simple. And then you've got the guy who's like going like this, and he's got these like, things coming out of his head, right? <laughs> and um, I don't even know what the name for that emoji is, but on the Instagram blog, they mention how um, they do big data analysis and all of the keywords that are associated with that, emo that symbol, and they're all over the place. I mean, one of them is like la laughing but very serious, LBBS -L -L or whatever. <laughs> And, you know, but the other one is like late night thoughts, and the other one is like praying. You know, it's like this little guy with sparks coming out of his head could be anything to anybody, right? And so you think of how, I mean, there's a lot of um, research in semiotics, another cross-domain reference for you there, um, but there's a lot of studies in semiotics um, where a symbol can mean so many different things to different people who share the same language. They're using the same emoji, they're speaking the same emoji language, and yet, I could send you a message that you receive completely differently. And in marketing, um, or in communicating with human beings in general in this new media context, all of a sudden we can't understand each other completely. And that, pro that proposes for me the biggest challenge in communicating, because now, no matter what the network, I'm trying to learn how to navigate this cultural lexicon that is constantly changing. So, challenges. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that about wraps up the panel. So thank you so much to our panelists. And thank you for your questions. I think now we have a cookie break. So let's go.